All right, so you've, you know, you've chosen really simple uh, default choices for your problem in your network, and now it's time to sit down and actually implement those. The steps here are, first, you need to actually get your model to run at all, which in deep learning can be um, not as trivial as it sounds. And then the next thing I recommend doing is overfitting a single batch of data. And we'll talk about why that's important and how to do it right. And then lastly, you should compare to a known result to just give you more confidence that your model is performing as well as you think it should be performing. Just to give you a preview, um, this is kind of a list of what I typically see as the five most common bugs in deep learning models. Um, the first is incorrect shapes for your tensors. And um, this is a very common one. And the dangerous thing here is that it can fail silently. And a lot of times that's due to um, you know, your, uh, a lot of these sort of um, automatic differentiation systems do um, silent broadcasting. And so you can have tensors that become different shapes somewhere in your network. And um, that can cause a lot of problems. I think pre-processing your inputs incorrectly is also very common. So if you forget to normalize your inputs, your results might be bad. Or if you over-normalize your inputs, right? So if, you, you know, if your library is already scaling your images to be t between 0 and 1, but then you um, divide them by 255, then, you, then the scale of those images might still be really bad for the network. Um, another common way for this to fail is if, um, if you're doing data augmentation and you haven't really checked to see if the amount of data augmentation that you're doing is reasonable. Um, a lot of times what I see is that you know, your data augmentation will actually make the task unsolvable. Incorrect inputs to your loss function. You know, in TensorFlow and PyTorch, the loss functions expect the inputs to be um, of a certain form. right? So either if you're doing a, a softmax, then either you want the inputs to be the raw logits, or you want, them, um, or you want to have actually um, uh, already taken the softmax. And so just being careful about which one of those things your loss function expects. Forgetting to set up train mode for the net, this typically happens with batch norm. It's one of the reasons I recommend not using batch norm from the start. And then finally, sort of a catch all for a lot of different types of problems is numerical instability. So if you're getting um, NANs in your output. And this usually comes from you know, doing some kind of exponent or log or division operation somewhere in your neural net code. Um, so that's kind of the place that I'd start to look for bugs like that. A few pieces of general advice for implementing your model. Um, the first is I typically try to start with a very lightweight implementation. And so for what this means for me is the minimum possible new lines of code for the first version. And I think a rule of thumb that I try to follow is to have less than 200 lines of code for the first version of the model that I'm training. And so this, uh, this of course, doesn't count like tested infra infrastructure components or TensorFlow, right? You don't want to try to rewrite TensorFlow from scratch in 200 lines of code. Actually, that would be a really fun exercise to try. I wonder, uh, yeah, I wonder if you could do uh, like automatic differentiation with 200 lines of code. I bet you could. Um, use off-the-shelf components. So you know, we're using Keras in this course. Um, Keras is great because most of the stuff in Keras works really well out of the box. Um, use the built-in implementations of dense layers. Don't sort of do the math yourself. Um, and uh, so that, that will help you avoid a lot of numerical instability issues. Complicated data pipelines are really important for sort of large-scale machine learning systems. But I recommend not starting with them. Um, because data pipelines themselves can be a big source of bugs. And so I would start when you're initially working on a problem with a data set that you can load into memory. All right, so let's go through the steps. So the first thing you need to do is get your model to run it all. There's a few things that could, that could prevent this from happening. Um, you know, one common issue is that you have a shape mismatch or you have a casting issue, right? Um, and I think the way to try to address these types of problems is to just step through your model creation step by step in a debugger. So go through each line of when you're adding a new tensor and just you know, um, check whether to see whether the, the tensors are the, the right shapes that you expect them to be at that point and have the right data types. Out of memory issues um, can be really difficult to debug. But one thing that I like to do is just 
scale back your memory intensive operations one by one. So if you're creating like large matrices anywhere in your neural net code, um, you, know, you can just look at the size of those matrices and maybe try to make one of the dimensions smaller. You can reduce your batch size, so you can cut your batch size in half and see if those things address the problem. And then for anything else, there's I think kind of the standard debugging toolkit, which is basically just like Google it. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are a lot of good, a lot of common issues are addressed on the internet at this point. I wanna zoom in a little bit on this process of stepping through model creation in a debugger um, and talk about debuggers for deep learning code. So in PyTorch, this is easy. Um, you can just use um, IPDB. In TensorFlow, at least TensorFlow 1.0, it's trickier. And um, that, the reason for that is that you, um, there's a, TensorFlow separates the process of creating the graph and actually executing operations in the graph. And so how can you actually do this? You can, one thing you can do is you can just step through the graph creation itself. Um, and so you can, you, know, you can jump into a debugger and then as you're creating layers, uh, you can just sort of inspect each of those layers. And you can look at the, their shapes and their data types and things like that. Um, and then if you have a TensorFlow session created, you can run, you can you know, call run in that session and, um, and see what the shapes of things are. And so you can actually do this in the training loop itself if you want to. There's another option called TFDB. And TFDB um, basically does what I covered on the last slide automatically, or at least it claims to. So every time you get a, um, a every time you call sesh.run in a TensorFlow session, then it stops execution and lets you sort of inspect where everything is. Um, I actually don't typically use this myself, but I think this could be a good option um, for if you're using sort of TensorFlow 1.0 and you want to inspect your tensors more easily. All right, so to summarize, getting your model to run, um, there are a lot of issues that can cause your model not to run. And I think the, the strategies that I recommend are um, mostly just stepping through your model creation in, in a debugger, making sure that all the shapes and data types are what you'd expect them to be, and if there are any like cryptic errors, then at least starting by, by uh, Googling them, because the, the error messages in TensorFlow and PyTorch are not always the most straightforward. All right, and there's a couple of more detailed strategies for shape mismatch and casting issues and out of memory issues that I'm not gonna cover right now, um, but um, I would recommend taking a look at the slides if you're interested. Okay, so you've gotten, you know, your model is at least running now, right? Um, so you're not done yet. The next thing that you need to do in order to give yourself more confidence that your model is running correctly is to overfit a single batch of data. And this is, in my experience, a, a heuristic that catches like an absurd number of bugs. Um, and I think it's really easy to skip this because you know, it just seems like, of course, my implementation is, is good enough to overfit a single batch of data. But in reality, um, that's often not the case. And it's much better to catch the types of bugs that would cause you not to be able to do this early rather than um, waiting until you're, you know, you've gone and implemented a bunch of stuff and then needing to go back. Um, and so what I mean by overfitting a single batch is really, you know, you wanna be able to drive your training error arbitrarily close to zero. So, you know, if you get your training error down to like 0 0.01 and then it sort of plateaus, then that doesn't count. Like you wanna be able to see that it can go as close as you want it to go to zero. So what are the things that could um, happen when you try to overfit a single batch and it fails? One issue is the error could go up and, um, Commonly, this is due to a, a flip sign somewhere. So if you are, um, you know, if you're minimizing the log probability instead of maximizing the log probability. Um, if the error explodes, so if it, you know, goes down and then sort of jumps up and, uh, you know, becomes infinite, then that's usually a numerical issue. But it could also be caused by high learning rate. If the error oscillates, so it goes up and then down and then up and then down, then the first thing I would try is just lowering your learning rate. And if that doesn't work, then I would inspect your data and just try to see if there's any sort of um, shuffled labels or um, incorrect um, data augmentation that's causing the problem to be too difficult. 
if the error plateaus, so if it kind of goes down to some number and then sort of stays around that number, then what I would do is I would try to turn up the learning rate, and I would get rid of all regularization. Um, and so that can help you sort of break through those plateaus. And if that doesn't work, then I would just check your loss function. I would like kind of inspect your loss function to make sure that it's defined the way that you expect it to be defined. And I would also look at your data pipeline, again, to make sure that there's no bugs in how your data is being fed into the model. All right, so once you're able to overfit a single batch, then you know, this is telling you that at least your model is able to like, drive loss down on a really small amount of data. But it could still, there could still be issues in your training pipeline that cause it not to be able to perform as well as it should be able to perform. So the next thing I recommend doing is comparing your results to some sort of known result. Right? And there are many different types of known results that you can compare to, and they're not all created equal. So I think the, the most useful known result that you can compare to, if there is one, is an official implementation of the model that you're looking for, evaluated on a sim uh, similar data set to yours. And so what this allows you to do is not only compare your performance to theirs to make sure you're performing as well as you expected, but to literally step through both of the models side by side. And if your model does something different, you can know exactly where in your training pipeline it differs. If you can't find an official implementation, then um, on a similar data set, then you can compare official implementations on some standard benchmark data set. Um, and if you can't find an official implementation, you can use an unofficial implementation of the model. Um, here, I would be very careful because in my experience, most of the sort of you know, implementations of neural networks that you find on GitHub, there are bugs in almost all of them, I think. Um, and so I think, like, I think this is a good strategy to use, but I would just be very cautious and um, if, you're, if you're not getting the same results as the implement, implementation that you found, then you, know, you should ask yourself whether it's because your model has a bug or whether it's because the model that you downloaded actually has a bug. Um, if there's no implementation, you can compare directly to the results um, on a similar data set or on a benchmark data set. And um, I think one strategy that's also valuable and uh, maybe less useful than the others, but very underrated, is to compare your, the results of your model to some super simple baseline, right? You can even just like literally average the output values, um, average the labels, um, and compare your, compare, your loss, uh, compare your error to what is the error if I just took the average of all the labels as my output. Um, or you can also do this with like a linear regression model. And um, I think, you know, again, this is much less useful, but I think it, um, is an underrated strategy because you know a lot of times you can put a lot of effort into a neural network only to find out later that linear regression is actually doing better. Okay, to summarize, um, how to implement your model and, um, and debug it. You know, the first step is to get your model to run it all. And this usually involves stepping through it in a, de in a debugger and watching out for kind of shape mismatches and casting issues and out of memory errors. Once your model runs, um, then you can overfit a single batch of data. And finally, compare to a known result to just give you more confidence that your model is doing what you'd expect it to do. Any questions about this section? So one question is, could you talk more about the sources of bugs in batch or that batch norm can introduce? Yeah, so um, briefly, batch norm introduces, at least in most implementations I've seen, um, has a, it uses a flag that asks whether you're in train mode or test mode. Um, and so this is to determine whether to update the statistics of batch norm um, on this batch. And um, it's really easy to forget to set that flag or to set it incorrectly. Um, and uh, yeah, and th so that's I think probably the most common one. Do you have recommendations on how to reproduce results of papers without code? That published code, I assume. Yeah, I think um, this can be really hard. Um, I would say, you know, it's so. I would say, you know, there. It's not always possible to do it. First of all. Second of all, you know, I think if you give the implementation um, implementation of a paper that doesn't have code, you know, sort of a good faith effort, and you're really careful about making sure that you've looked at 
all of the details in the paper. So you've looked at the appendices and you've seen you know, everywhere that they might be hiding their hyperparameters. Um, and you're confident that you don't have enough information to implement the model, um, then I think a good next step is to email the authors. And you know, most of the time, authors of papers are interested in making sure that people can reproduce their results, even if they're not able to release code for whatever reason. Um, and so I think if you've, you know, it, it's a good strategy to do like kind of once you've already put a lot of effort on your own into, into implementing it. I think if you just email the authors of the paper asking for help, but you haven't done your homework, then most of the time they'll ignore you. How to debug if a model shows unreasonable accuracy? Like so if the accuracy better, is too better high? Better than known, yeah. Hmm. Better than expected. Yeah, I would say this is most likely a data issue, right? So um, the, first, like, the first instinct that I would have is to look for whether you're leaking any information in, um, into your training examples. When might one use cyclical learning rates as described by Leslie Smith and use them fast at AI? Yeah, um, I think cyclical ra learning rates are a useful tool and I would treat this as part of your hyperparameter tuning toolkit. And there's, yeah, fast, fast AI is a good library that implements yeah. that stuff. Um, Well, there's a question. How often do you re-implement papers? Um, I recommend doing it frequently. Yeah, it's a, it's a good muscle to build. What was your favorite implementation experience from a paper? Favorite implementation experience from a paper? Um, well, I guess a relatively recent one that was fun was um, re-implementing the GQN paper from DeepMind. Um, it was fun because it was hard. Um, I think, yeah, uh, I'll, which, I'll leave it at one? that. GQN. Isn't it misleading to assume the learning rate or regularization is incorrect based on the one single batch? In other words, can fine-tune hyperparameters on a single batch generalize the whole data set? No, you absolutely should not fine-tune parameters on a single batch, and that's not what I'm recommending. Um, I think what you can, one, one thing that you might realize when you're trying to overfit a single batch is that you know, for whatever reason, your learning rate is just way too high or way too low. Um, and so I think it's just a thing to be aware of um, it, when you're going through that process is that, like, it might just be the case that your learning rate is so high that the weights of your model are just fluctuating um, basically randomly. And so then, you know, you, that would be where you'd consider reducing your learning rate. But I, you certainly should not be, like, tuning any of your hyperparameters on a single batch. Should you be worried if you change the framework and the accuracy increases? Change, what do you mean change the framework? Change framework from original paper, I assume. I don't know. Is it justified when accuracy increases when you change framework from original paper? No. Yeah, you should be worried. Although, I mean, so I think one of the interesting things about re-implementing papers is that, like, a lot of times the original, original implementation will also have bugs in it. And so it is, it is possible to do better than the original paper. Uh, with your implementation. Which, do you recommend the paper for a first time experience to re-implement? I would pick something that you're interested in. Um, I would pick something, I think if you're doing it for the first time, I would pick something where you know, there, are, there are other implementations that you can reference as you go along. Um, and so that you can compare your work to um, how other people have tried to implement this paper and learn from that. Um, I think if you're implementing papers as a way of getting a job, for example, then I think you'll eventually want to move on to implementing things that fewer people have implemented because it's an easier way to stand out. But uh, to start, I would do something that's sort of well, that you're really interested in, and that is well-trodden um, ground. Great. <laughs>